Excuse me. All right, I'm live. I don't know if you caught me just coughing and hacking for a second there, but this is the uh, this is the Q and A, the Friday Q and A, twenty questions with uh, Pastor Mike. I'm Mike Winger, and I'm here to try to help you learn to think biblically about everything. You, may, those of you who regularly watch, you may have noticed that my microphone is no longer in my face. I it will take a few weeks of tweaking, but I'm experimenting with a, a new way of doing things with a different microphone that might not take up as much space, and then I don't whack it as much with my hands, and I'm free to do more of this because. I obviously don't talk with my hands enough. So here we go. The first question we have for today comes in from um, Mfo Sindane, who says, what are soul ties and are they biblical? And I can't, I can't pretend to speak to everything about soul ties. So let, let's just think about it a little bit together. And I'll share a few thoughts I have, uh, having not spent a ton of time on it, but having spent a little bit of time on it. Um, it seems first off, the first question, what are soul ties is the hardest one <laughs> because, because different people answer this question in radically different ways. You have like, let's take for instance, the, the sort of, um, <clears throat> perspective on say soul ties that we've got from, uh, more like, I wouldn't say exactly secular, but let's say not Christian groups. Okay. So there, there might be new age beliefs in there might be no, like spirituality without religion, that kind of misnomer. They might be thinking that that's their category. And they'll talk about soul ties uh, as though these these things are um, basically like a crush. Sometimes they talk about it like it's a crush. I saw there's a WikiHow article on how to identify and deal with soul ties. And they li give a list of reasons. Of, if you have a soul tie, it means that you think about this person all the time. You feel a special connection to them. You, you might dream about them. And I'm like, yeah, that just sounds like a teenage crush. Um, but then there's another category where people will talk about soul ties as though they're like a, a danger and a threat. And that is more often what we get from people that are more overtly religious and, and even in the more deliverance ministries. Okay, now I'm not against deliverance ministries, but I think that deliverance ministries come with potential problems that at least the most prominent ones, the one you see the most online, at least I see the most online, they seem like they fall into these problems. And the more local ones where it's just, it seems like maybe they handle things with more wisdom. So I'm just being straight with you guys. This is my impression. But these deliverance ministries, they approach soul ties, it feels like in a very different way. So to them, soul ties are like these unhealthy connections that may or may not have to do. And some of them might say a soul tie is this connection between your soul and someone else's soul. They're tied together. Um, they'll, they'll define it in somewhat vague terms. It's a spiritual connection of some kind. And it could have been arrived at through like physical intercourse or maybe just some kind of obsession. They'll even show that you, you could have soul ties to people. Those people, it could be romantic you know, relationship, or it could be like a leader. It's not romantic at all, but it's just a leader and you have a soul tie to them. I saw a guy talking about that. Um, it could be a soul tie to a child. I saw a, a video where a guy was talking about this, talking about breaking soul ties. And he, and he was saying, you know, soul ties to children can be a thing where it's an unhealthy soul tie. And then they'll give you these steps of how to break the soul tie. So the steps kind of come, it seems to me, they come from the perspective of like, I'm sort of your guide, your spiritual guide. And I will offer you the the rituals and the rules on how to break the soul ties. Now, I'm a little suspicious of this, but I'm not, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. So I have a bit of a conf conflicting ideas about it. So let me share with you some of the things I've, I wrote down for myself. Um, some is the, the, the fact that um, some will say a soul tie is simply like a vague spiritual connection between two people. And the more vague they make it, the harder it is to say that it's wrong. But then it's hard for them, if they're going to really be that vague, to then justify all their rituals and rules for how this works, how to identify it, and how to get rid of it. Because if it's that vague that you can defend it easily, it, it doesn't really lead to all these sort of, you need the spiritual guru to help you through it. Others will be much more specific. Then they'll say, hey, we've you know, like I'm hearing you tell your story and I'm identifying a soul tie. Ah, I see you have a soul tie with that person. And some will go way off the deep end and they'll actually do, and I would consider this off the deep end. They'll say you're spiritually married to that person. That person's your spiritual husband or wife. Now I, I'm not saying the majority of the soul tie people do this, but just to understand the fringe, the, they will actually offer divorces where you can get a spiritual divorce. So let's say I'm married to my wife and there's someone who's obsessed with me. Some woman is obsessed with me. Somebody might conclude that that person is my spiritual wife. They bound themselves to me, spiritually speaking, and, and now I have to have a spiritual divorce. 
I'm like, no, I'm in no way validating their obsession by acting like there's an actual connection with me. Um, that that's creepy. Um, and then anyway, the divorce, the spiritual divorce stuff, that just starts to get pretty weird. So what scriptures do they use to, to suggest that soul ties are a real thing? Let's look at some of that. Um, so first Samuel 18, one, <clears throat> oops, let me try that one more time. First Samuel 18, one. Um, this is speaking of David and Jonathan. It says, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So there's definitely like a real connection that's happening here, right? Is it a soul tie though? Does is This This is a tough one. Is, is it a figure of speech to mean that that David was deeply connected to, to, um, to Jonathan, that there was like this commitment they had to one another as friends, kind of like a Frodo and Sam kind of situation here. I mean, really, in a sense, David's like Frodo and, and Jonathan's like Sam, if you guys are Lord of the Rings fans, as you obviously you are, obviously. So is that a soul tie though? Are we actually saying that in this in the spiritual realm, there was a actual connection between the two souls of these people? Or is it a figure of speech that souls being knit together merely meant that they were like deeply connected you know, in a way that doesn't require like some sort of, I've heard some described as a physical connection in the spiritual realm, which is, it just starts to feel like we're reading a lot into it. Is it possible? I mean, it's possible on that text, but the text isn't really teaching it. And it's certainly not negative here. It's a very positive thing. David and Jonathan's close relationship is a very positive thing in scripture. It's a wonderful thing. It's, Saul should have treated him the same way. That's one of the things they'll, they'll, they'll uh, look at. Another one is the first Corinthians passage. Um, let me see, I didn't get the exact verse here. Um, let me find it real quick. <clears throat> First Corinthians 6, 16, where it says, bouncing around, or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two shall become one flesh, will become one flesh. And so some would say this is about that physical connection in, in intercourse. Okay, this is obviously not, not marriage. I don't think he's talking about marriage. He's talking about just sex and that that creates a type of connection a oneness with them now some would say see that's another kind of soul tie well this is obviously let's just say categorically this is radically different than whatever david and jonathan had there was no sexuality going on there there's no two becoming one none of that's going on with david and jonathan so if we're going to rope this in and say that whatever happens between a man and a prostitute is equal like is the same category of a soul tie and then call it two becoming one. Now we're actually blurring biblical lines. Now we're confusing things. So there's a, a baby in the bathwater, which is when you sleep with somebody, when you, when you are with them intimately, there is a real connection that happens there. It doesn't equal marriage, but it's almost like a mutated version of marriage outside the marriage bed, outside of that commitment. And that that is something that is like a big deal to God. It should be a big deal to us. Is it a soul tie? It just says the two become one. It talks about their flesh, their their fleshes, their bodies are joined together. Is that the connection of their souls? Now, let me give you an example of how this gets weird. After I die and I am entering into the presence of God, will I still have a soul tie connection to those whoever I had slept with in this life? Now, I've only ever been with my bride, okay? We've saved ourselves to our marriage. But will we still have a soul tie now, some would like to say yes, because the romanticness of the marriage being sort of brought into heaven, it can be slightly challenging, though, because Jesus said there is no marriage in heaven. But imagine if you slept with 15, 20, 100 people in your life. Do you carry a soul tie with you? Because your soul goes up into heaven as well. So now you've got you've, you've created a scenario where you're probably saying more than what the scripture is trying to say about this issue. Um, the, the, the two become one is outside of marriage is definitely a bodily connection. Is it a soul connection exactly? I, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, let's see. There's another verse, <clears throat> um, which would be, let's see. I, I saw a guy who was sharing a few of these. Genesis 44.30. And I'll share with you how he used it. And this is why I, I have, there's a, there's a good and bad side to it. So this is where Jacob is going to find it. He's potentially going to find out news that Benjamin's not around and ben, and he already lost one of his sons, or at least he believes that his son died. Joseph died. And Joseph was like the son of his beloved wife, his favorite wife. Okay. There's all kinds of weird family 
issues going on there that we don't need to address right now. But that son representing that wife um, represents a lot to him. And when he lost his son and then she had one more, Benjamin, and then died, died giving birth to Benjamin. So Benjamin carries his love for his wife and all this other stuff. So now they come back, these brothers of Jake, of, of, uh, of Benjamin come back and they say, now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, that's the phrase, as soon as he sees the boy is not with, with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. He's saying, hey, dad will just give up life. He will, get, he will be so depressed and so ruined by this, this trauma. And it's understandable why they say this, because they saw him, you know, when he, um, when he lost uh, Joseph, they saw him. They saw him when he lost his wife, one of his wives. Yeah, that's complicated and, and, and not good. And now they know what will happen if they lose Benjamin, the last remnant of both of those people, that if he lost him too. So is that a soul tie? And, and this teacher I saw online who has uh, like oh, more subscribers on YouTube than I do, not, I'm not suggesting that that's, this is not an arrogance thing for those who think it is, that you're just misunderstanding. I don't think subscriber counts tell you anything about the quality of a person. But my point is that this is a teaching that, that is actually not hidden in a corner. That's all I'm suggesting. And he says, you could have a bad soul tie to your children because, you know, if you, if your children not coming to the Lord or betraying you or, or doing something bad, if that just kills you, if that just ruins your life, then, then you must have a bad soul tie and you have to break that soul tie. And I'll be the guru who gives you the special tips and tools on how to break the soul tie. Again, I don't think scripture is getting at that. I think it's talking about how important this son is. I don't think it's necessarily meant to disparage this love he has for his son, Benjamin, um, I, I just, I just don't, I think what we're doing is we have a concept, soul ties. We see this as a problem behind a bunch of other issues people really have, real problems they have, and we're going to diagnose it as, oh, that's a soul tie issue. You're, you and your kids, you're too connected. You're too connected to your leaders, that's a soul tie issue. You're too connected to this person you're not married to, that's a soul tie issue. You're even too connected to your spouse, that's a soul tie. We have to break these soul ties, and I'm going to be the guru who shows you how. People can really get deliverance, though, by doing this. This is this is the baby with the bathwater. They can really get a type of deliverance because whatever the real problem is, when they've got this sort of ungodly, let's say I had a, a fascination with a woman other than my wife, and someone goes, Mike, you have a soul tie with that woman. You need to pray, and here's the steps. Um, you repent. You acknowledge that it's an unhealthy relationship. You repent of it. I'm like, that's a good step, whether there's a soul tie or not. That's just a good step. Then you get rid of their phone number and any connection you have with them. That's a good step whether there's real soul ties or not. Then you're going to get rid of any sort of memorabilia you have around your house that reminds you of that person, that kind of brings that relationship to your mind and, and heart. That's a good step, <laughs> whether, the, whether soul ties are real or not. So a lot of these can be good steps. That, that's, that's the good thing about the soul ties. The bad thing is it doesn't seem biblical. Um, and it seems that the examples that are brought up in Scripture to, to kind of create a, a soul tie doctrine are different issues being sort of categorized together and smushed in a way that doesn't quite bring clarity. So if there is such a thing as some kind of soul tie, I don't see a clear teaching in scripture that declares it. And I wouldn't want to create a whole doctrine and a whole religious practice around it. But I also recognize people are being helped by these people who are like, hey, step one, step two, step three, here's how you break from these bad commitments you have. Here's a couple other problems though with soul ties I'll mention that come to my mind, at least potential problems. Um, what we're describing as a connection, meaning that my soul is actually attached, spiritually actually attached to someone else's, um, I think is really probably just good and bad commitments or good and bad obsessions. That would be more accurate. Like it, you're not actually attached to that person you're lusting after. You're not actually connected to them in some spiritual realm where they actually, in some sense, belong to you or are part of you. That's not true. What's really going on is you're just obsessed with them. You're committed to them. Your heart's going out to them, right? But there isn't actually, your hearts are not connected in that sense unless they feel the same way. Um, also, um, the the movement of gurus and secret knowledge and having to have formulas instead of genuine led spirit prayer where you, where you spirit led prayer, excuse me, um, where you sort of listen to the people and the Lord gives you wisdom on how to guide them perhaps in a prayer. Instead, I have a formula. I'm like, I'm going to find, oh, you've got issues. I'm going to find your soul ties. Let's, let's dig. I'll ask questions till I find your soul ties. And it becomes a formula. And that's when it starts being, stops being 
probably true. Um, another issue would be, where is it? I got, oh, I, okay, here we go. Two things, I'll ask two things I'll say. We'll jump to the next question and we'll do all the. Oh, by the way, thanks for someone. I won't mention names. Someone who sent me the shirt, made the shirt former embryo. I appreciate that. I like that. Um, that goes back for those who know, you know. But the one of the other problems with potentially with soul ties and with leaning on that is that it it pretends there's a relationship where there isn't one. And this could actually be unhealthy for people. So if a woman comes to you and tells you as a, as, a, as a counselor, as a pastor, as a Christian, I'm really obsessed with this man, he's married, but I'm obsessed with him, and you tell her she has a soul tie to that man, this could actually feed her obsession in an unhealthy way because she thinks that her obsession is a connection. Now there can be a sense of belonging and a sense of ownership that is not healthy, that is not something you want to you feed in that relationship. Um, another issue with the soul tie thing is it external, externalizes your issues. You don't need repentance as much as you need deliverance. So if there's like a string, a spiritual string connecting my soul to that person or that thing, then I need something to cut the string and release me. Now what this does is it kind of takes the ownership of the problem off of me, and that can be unhealthy if the problem really is mine. And so one of the issues that, that this can happen with deliverance ministries is that it can become sort of I'm always delivering you from external problems. And whatever you do that's wrong, it, drinking, you know, too much, rather, drinking like drunkenness, um, you, drugs, or whatever issue you've got, adultery, lust, these are, these are things you have to be delivered from. Now, a lot of deliverance ministries will include, include repentance in, the, in how they bring deliverance from those issues. And so they're actually addressing maybe the personal responsibility. So I'm not saying that's not there, but at least it can lend towards that. It can turn, it can externalize the issue perhaps when it doesn't need to be. Now I say all this with a grain of salt because there's, there may be external factors that I don't know about. And I'm not the spiritual guru who can just hear, you know, sit down with you, hear your story and just always know this, the invisible forces behind the issues you face. But I do know that in scripture, it seems that the emphasis when dealing with things like adultery and lust and ungodly commitments and idolatry is always on the person repenting of those things and not some external one coming in to deliver them from those things. And so I tend to focus on that because I think that's what scripture continually focuses on. So soul ties, don't think it's a biblical doctrine. Don't think the scriptures are being brought together to use them carefully. Um, third issue would be there is baby with the bathwater. People really may experience some real help and there may be something there going on. I just don't think it's taught in scripture and so i hesitate to lean on it we'll go to the second question and that's coming in from turka orenzova who says dear mike our pastor said on sunday that jesus wasn't god here on earth let me read the whole sentence um, our pastor said on sunday that jesus wasn't god here on earth until the baptism of john and descending of the Holy Spirit, it, surround, it sounded really bad to my ears. Can you comment, please? So this is what was, I think, an old, old, old heresy called adoptionism. And it's believed by some that that's, that's what, um, that that's what, believed by some who, were, who, who the early church would, would eventually say, hey, you're not, you're not Christian. Like, this is, this is not okay. It's not a denial of Jesus' deity in all respects, but it's a denial of his deity, deity for 30 years of his life on earth. And that's deeply concerning. Um, so then when Jesus came to the earth, did he pre-exist and then he came to the earth and now he stopped being God? But God is part of his very core nature. So if he ceased having that, then who is it that was walking the earth? Is Jesus a deified man or is he God who t took on human flesh? Uh, scripture that might bring in some clarity on this is John chapter 1. So John chapter 1, I think, gives us, uh, there's no debate available to us. So it says here, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Okay, this is pre-incarnate. This is the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. Pre-incarnate, the word was God. This is so clear. He, and it's, anyway, there's so many cool things about John 1, but I'll keep reading. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. 
The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So this speaks of Jesus and his deity, but also in his relationship within the Trinity. So he's God and he's with God. So he's, you can't deny his deity and you can't deny there's some plurality sense in which God has relation with himself. And we see this in the persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Then it talks about John, um, but then we'll skip ahead to uh, verse 14 where it says, and the word, now we know who the word is, that's, that's God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory as of the glory of the only son of, from the father, full of grace and truth. This is the one who, what he became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, when he came to John and the baptism happened, he was revealed publicly to be the son of God. And this was, it was known, right? It was known by others, but it was like, not as well known. And so it was no more publicly when John baptizes Jesus and the voice from heaven says, you know, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Right? But here in the gospels, before this happens, the, the moment of the incarnation is the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this starts at the birth of Christ. Then he goes out into, into the wilderness and he's baptized by John. That was a public declaration of who Christ is. When God says, this is my beloved son, it doesn't mean this is the moment you have, you are becoming my son. So the problem with adoptionism is it, it treats Jesus as if he becomes the son of God and then any sort of deities attached to that moment of becoming, but rather he was always God. He took on flesh and then was approved by God because we're, we, where we failed, he succeeded. Um, now, you, you know, you asked this question and then said, uh, you find it, you know, concerning. It sounds really bad to your ears. I would say this sounds um, horribly, horribly bad. And I would personally, um, this would be a, a real line in the sand for me where I would want to approach the pastor and first, first start with this. Did I understand you right? Can you explain this to me? What you meant by that? And maybe gather some questions ahead of time so you can really poke at it and just kind of understand, like, are you really saying what I think you're saying? Gather some scriptures to talk to him. Talk to him about it. If if you if he is saying what you're saying, and then you share with him, and re, you bring biblical correction, and he refuses you, then I would take it to what other other leaders are in the church and take it to them, and say the same thing. If they reject you, I would tell whoever you have access to in the church, and then leave. I mean, I don't really know a better process for this based on the information you're giving me. This is deeply concerning. So yeah, old 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 heresy. Number three. Let's look at Gavin Hatcher who says, when I feel good, I find myself doubting less, being more loving, sinning less. How do I know if I'm growing in the spirit or if it's just my antidepressants making me nicer? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Um, I would say you're probably not growing in the spirit, but that doesn't mean you aren't doing good things. Let me see if I can unpack this a little, at least my perspective on it, Gavin. Um, if you take antidepressants and they help you, I don't see a problem with that. I'm not a, I'm not a, I, I, I'm, I'm torn on antidepressants, not because I think they're spiritually bad, but because I just don't know how much I trust pharmaceutical companies. I've known people who've had improvements and they're like, I'm so grateful I, I took those things. I've known others who had massive drawbacks and massive problems. And I just don't know that I trust these companies and doctors to always have our best interests or the knowledge to provide the best treatment for us. Um, I've had a lot of bad experiences with doctors in my life and still continually do. So, so I'm just, I'm like nervous about all this stuff um, for, for those reasons. But that's just me speaking on a personal level. I just want to say my, my hesitance there and, and why I'm going to take all that and just set it aside and go, let me just grant that none of that's on the table here. You're, you're taking these antidepressants. They really help you. And when you take them, you find that you're, 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 you're more godly. Right, you're feeling good in life, and so you're more loving. You sin less. Um, how do you know if that's the spirit or antidepressants? Well, I mean, in a sense, it's it's the antidepressants, but it's not only that. Uh, let me let me give you an illustration that might help. Okay, so from my perspective, how I'd understand this: when you're feeling good, it's for any of us, whether you're on antidepressants or not. When you're feeling good, it's easier to to do good. You're positive. You're content, you're happy. And so for all of us, it's easier to do good when we're feeling good. That's not as much of a test of our character and our spirituality as it is when we're doing terrible. Now, when you're doing poorly, when life is bring, going downhill instead of uphill, 
That's the more test of character. So I'm glad that this can restore you to feeling better. That's nice. And I'm assuming that that's like proper and good and that there's not all these bad drawbacks. I don't know. But that's a good good thing. But that doesn't make you more spiritual because you would probably always behave that way if you just felt that good all the time. The real test spiritually is when you're down. So look at the book of Job. Job was tested when he when his life was terrible. This was a test. Now, I, nobody expected Job to be as friendly as he was before all this craziness happened in his life. And so that's not what I mean. But his faithfulness to God was tested through trials. Um, First Peter talks about this, that, that our faith is tested through various trials, that it shows the authenticity of our faith. So it's those down times where I don't, I wouldn't expect you or anyone to be perfectly as smiley and jolly as, as they are, you know, when they're up here, when they're feeling down here. But when they're feeling down here, the test is, do they yield to this increased temptation to sin? You know, I, when I'm down, I get more easily frustrated. And this is, this is probably something a lot of you would understand. <laughs> I'm more easily frustrated with things and more quick to lash out or to have a bad perspective on issues. And it's, it's a much more of a battle to slow myself down and stop and, and, and think and pray before I act. That's the test of my spirituality. So I would say it's positive that you're feeling better, but the test of your spirituality is those times when you're feeling down. Next time you're in a down cycle... Can you behave more godly than last time? That would show spiritual growth since your question's about spiritual growth. Let's go to question number four. This is from Sin Bull, who says, oh, and by the way, all our questions are full. We've got all 20 questions and I'm just going to blast through them here. Hey, Mike, how do you approach slash convince a Muslim that Jesus is more than just a prophet? Um, so Sin, I'm, I'm not as experienced in Islamic apologetics and Islamic stuff as you probably need to answer this question better. My approach when, when I would come to a Muslim personally would be to just start by asking them tons of questions, understand where they're coming from. Have they read their Quran? What do they think it teaches? Um, and I, I mean, the different angles I would consider approaching would be trying to look at and gather things the Quran or the Hadith say about Jesus that are positive. Um, maybe historical analysis of some of the claims in the Quran. Um, perhaps showing the scriptures and having conversations about that. It's tough because with Muslims, what you have is, you know, hundreds of years after Jesus, you have this new religion rise up that is kind of like a, a, a hijacking of Judaism and Christianity. I mean, although in a sense, Christianity is Judaism fulfilled, but they're saying, no, no, we're the real Jewish people. You know, it was, it wasn't uh, Isaac that was the son of the promise <laughs> that was that no no it's, it's our people that were and then we're we're the replacement um then when it comes to jesus the quran affirms that he's a prophet they believe that jesus was a prophet but like you said what about more than just a prophet when it comes to the cross it teaches islam teaches of course that jesus never actually died on the cross that god would never let such a fate happen to one of his prophets that's a challenge you're going to have to overcome they also teach that um as you know probably that um that god has no son that this is blasphemy and it's a horrible sin. It's a shirk in Islam to declare that God has a son. And so what you see when you look at it, when you zoom out, as you go, Christ, you know, Islam would affirm that the Bible is God's word, but then they'll affirm that it's, oh, it's been distorted in vague ways we won't specify. You just need to trust that our theology is correct. And our theology denies the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the personhood of Christ, his deity. So he's not the son of God. It denies central aspects of Christianity. So, I mean, you could go a historical route where you try to show that the evidence for the resurrection of Christ and his death is, is really strong. In fact, atheist scholars uh, even would say that the death of Jesus is one of the most certain facts in all of history that he was crucified by Pontius Pilate. One of the most certain facts in all of history. You could show that the Quran, perhaps a different angle, is, is problematic in many of its teachings. Uh, teaching that the sun sets in a pool of mud. Th this this is a teaching in the Quran. You can't really find a way around that. It says that Alexander the Great traveled to the place where the sun set in a pool of mud and people lived there. This is one of the teachings in the Quran. And the Quran's difficult to read, difficult to understand, partly because it's not arranged um, in, in, in any way that makes obvious sense to people. So they most often arrange it by uh, longest chapter to shortest chapter so this isn't chronological at all it's like long for the most part longest to shortest chapter 
Imagine taking someone's writings and just being, put the longest stuff first and the shortest stuff last, and that'll be, it becomes difficult to read and understand it. So yeah, what, what I'd recommend is you go and check out uh, maybe some of David Wood's content um, or Alan Schliemann. Alan Schliemann from Standard Reason has done a lot of stuff on Islam, and you can check that out as well. And there's plenty of others. I'm not the best source on that. Um, man. So, so I would start with lots of questions. Find out what this person believes, because later you can hold them to it in a positive way. You can say, hey, you said this. Now let's talk about that. And, um, and pray. Do not neglect prayer for this person and prayer for those conversations. Number five, Michael Yoder. Why is Jesus overturning the money tables in John 2 and not later when he enters Jerusalem around John 11 and 12? Did he do this two times and not just in his last week? Um, it's been a little while since I had those passages fresh in my mind. Let me look. I'll briefly look while I'm... Uh, Stalling for time here. Let's read. So in John 2, that's more fresh in my mind. I'm going to read John 12 here. It says, The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, when Jesus was glorified, they then rem uh, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd had been that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went out to meet him, verse eighteen there, was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Then it talks about others who came to worship at the feast. Um, Jesus predicts his death and his resurrection. And we have the people who respond with, with not ultimately not believing those things. Jesus talks about his purpose. And then it moves on. So what I would just want to point out a couple things real quick here, um, Michael, is... We don't have a record of Jesus overturning the tables in the second temple account in John 12, like we do earlier in John 2. We do have a record in the other Gospels of Jesus at this late time overturning tables, like you said in Matthew 21 and Mark 11. And that's definitely a late time. That 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 would be at the same, same time as the John 12 passage during the last Passover meal of Jesus his last visit to Jerusalem before the crucifixion anyway. So should we conclude from that, that John is saying Jesus did not overturn tables the second time he went to Jerusalem in the, in the book itself, the second time we have recorded in detail. And I think the answer is going to be, um, no, it, it, we should at least leave on the table the possibility that Jesus did overturn tables two times in the Gospel of John. But since John records the earlier account in John 2, he doesn't feel the need to talk about how Jesus did it again at a later time. That is, to me, this is definitely an open possibility. Why do all the, the other guys, at least two of the other Gospels, they want to say Jesus overturned these, these tables at this event because they don't record the earlier one and they do want to make sure they get that story across because it's important to talk about how Jesus was showing that the temple had been misused and he was trying to restore it to be a, a house of prayer for all people. Um, and he was ultimately fulfilling that purpose in himself because now we pray in his name and not through the temple. Beautiful symbolism there. So what we have here is a, um, a, a, a I think a simple explanation that says, yeah, maybe Jesus did it twice. John records the first one, doesn't see a need to record it later. He's saving space, and he's focusing on other elements in that later section. Uh, some people suggest that John is relocating an event, and that he's not speaking chronologically. He's he's ordering something thematically. And because later on he wants to focus, I mean, he focuses a lot, most of his book on the last 24 hours of Jesus. And so because he wants to focus on that, he does something a little different. You know, what, what he does is... Um, moves the, this is not my view, but this, they'll say he moves some of the events that happen here thematically to an earlier place in John's gospel so that we more early establish Jesus's purpose and function and all this other stuff. Um, I'm not inclined to view it that way. Plenty of godly Christian people who really believe in the, believe the Bible and believe in inerrancy and stuff will hold that view. And they'll say, oh yeah, John's just doing a, an acceptable biographic thing that they, under, that was understood at the time is you can, you can translocate events 
thematically instead of only speaking chronologically. Now that's entirely possible. Maybe that's the case. Maybe it only happened once and John moved it for thematic purposes. That's not my view, but I wanted to put that out there as for something for you to think about. Let's go to question number six. Jeff Weed says in 1 Samuel 23, 11 through 13, the Lord says David will be handed over to Saul at Keilah. Then David leaves town before Saul gets there. And so he was not. Did the Lord foretell a future event that did not happen? Let's look at that passage together. So is this a, an example of a failed prophecy? Okay, it says, um, let's back up a little bit. Okay, David is being hunted by Saul. David is looking for a place to hide. And some people are kind of loyal to David and some people are kind of loyal to Saul. So when David enters a place, he doesn't know if they'll if that place will rat on him and bring down the armies of Saul or not. And so um, let's back up a little bit and get a bit more of the story. I'm just going to go back to the beginning of the chapter. Now they told David, this is him at the city of Keilah, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors, this, which is terrible. This is after all the harvest is done. They're stealing the, the, the fruit of the harvest of all the months of growing and everything. They're, they're taking it right as they're harvesting it and threshing it out and stuff. Therefore, uh, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? It's a dangerous place for us to be, basically. Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered answered him, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. So David, he's just kind of playing it by ear, in a sense, except his ear is to the Lord <laughs> instead of his own ear. He's, he's just listening to what God's revealing, and he's going for that. So David and his men uh, went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told to Saul, it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. Now that's where it shifts. Okay, now, now Keilah is not a safe place anymore. Now it's scary. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself by entering a town that has gates and bars. Sorry, because Saul could just, uh, he could actually just siege the town and David can't escape. So then it's just a waiting game at that point. And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him. And he said to Abiathar the, the priest, bring the ephod here. Now, the reason why Abiathar is brought in is because he's going to use Abiathar as his conduit to seek counsel from God. So that's why he's there in the ephod and all that. Then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Right? He'll siege and destroy the whole place. Here's David's question. Will the men of Keilah surrender me to, into his hand? Are they going to give me up or are they going to defend me? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. So what do, what do we get there? Um, your question is, hey, like, you know, God says, Saul's going to come down and the men are going to deliver you. Was this prophecy of something God was going to make sure happened? Or was he telling... Um, was he telling David something that is it, that is a what if scenario? David's like, hey, if I'm here and if my men are here, as he's deciding whether to flee or not, will Saul come down? Yes, he'll come down. Will they deliver me into Saul's hand? Yes, they will deliver you. So he flees. This was a warning about what would or could happen, had would happen, I should say, if he remained there. But it wasn't a prophecy like God saying, um, I behold, I tell you this, you're, you're just going to die into story. There's no debate about it. Sometimes God tells people what will happen, and it's contingent on some ifs. The implicit if in this passage is, if I stay in this city, will this happen? And so he flees the city in response to that revelation. 
So your question is that, is that, is that like uh, God t- telling a future event that didn't happen? I think it's God showing something that his knowledge extends beyond just what will happen. This is amazing when you think about it. God's knowledge is not just about what will happen. He knows what would happen in any given scenario. That's significant. God knows if you did X, Y, Z, everything that would happen as a result. Lord, if I go to China, will I be able to be a a successful missionary there? The Lord would know the answer to that question. Lord, if I do this, if I start this, if I quit that, if I go over here, God knows the answers to all those questions. um, And he's just simply giving the information to them. All right, let's go to question seven. Julie Badowski says, what are your thoughts on the cruciform hermeneutic slash cruciform theology? Okay, Julie, I have looked into this to some degree. Um, This is one of the champions of this view. Maybe the champion of this view is Greg Boyd. And Greg Boyd pushes forward this, what he calls a cruciform hermeneutic. And and, um, it's one of those things where it's rather complicated and rather in depth. And he has like a 700 page book he's written on the topic, right? So I have not read through all that. I have heard him talk about it and I have read some snippets of it here and there to try to just understand the, the sort of outline of, of it. So here's my understanding of it, assuming that it's correct. I'll outline for you how I understand it. And then I'll tell you why I think it's really bad. <laughs> okay, so, um, so the, the cruciform hermeneutic is this idea that on the cross, it's kind of an analogy on the cross, Jesus does something and, and, what we're going to do is we're going to look to, especially the Old Testament, but even some of the New Testament, we're going to look at the Bible and say the Bible's kind of doing that too. Okay, so here's the thing Jesus does on the cross, and then it changes the way we interpret the Bible through the lens of the cross, which sounds very pious, but I, I don't think it is. So the cruciform hermeneutic says, hey, on the cross, Jesus was totally innocent. He didn't do anything wrong. He was there being crucified for the sins you committed and I committed, and it looked like he had done horrible, horrible things, but he didn't do that stuff. That was all you, that wasn't on him. He was dying and and suffering for all the evils of humanity. So the summary would be this, Jesus looked really bad and looked guilty of certain things on the cross that he was never guilty of. Now, how do I apply that to my interpretation of the Old Testament and some of the new, but definitely the old? Greg Boyd and others would say, as I understand it, and I hope I'm getting this accurately, When we see God doing things, we see things in God's mouth where God's like, go and and kill those people. My judgment is upon them, kill them. We see God slaying people in judgment. That stuff sometimes and often looks really extreme. And to, to especially a pacifist perspective, it looks evil. It looks bad. Now, I don't think it's bad. I think God is proper to judge. But, but for those who have these real moral challenges where they go, no, I, I can't handle that. I can't see the Canaanites being killed. Like that just seems way overboard. So they go, ah, just like on the cross, Jesus looked bad. It looked like he had done something bad, but he hadn't. So it looks like God is ordering them to kill the Canaanites, but he's not. That was never God's command. He's letting himself look bad for the sake of dealing with the blood, with man's bloodthirst. Do you see how this works? I can say, I have this vision of Jesus in my mind and then read, let the cross cast a shadow back over the Old Testament and it will illumine to me which passages that it says God declares this, but then I can go, no, he didn't really declare that. That was just him letting himself look bad for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of redeeming man. I think this is ultimately just a way of me editing out of scripture all the stuff that I don't like with, because I have a certain theology of God and a certain theology theology of Jesus that doesn't really fit the Bible. So I'm going to edit those things out. This is my, my blunt understanding of it. I find it to be deeply problematic. Um, in other ways, Greg Boyd has been a champion of Christianity and has been defending the things like the resurrection of Christ and some really core things. So I'm not suggesting, oh, he's all bad or something like that. But this cruciform hermeneutic, it's attempting to defend Christianity, but the way it does it is by agreeing with the critics of the Bible that all this stuff you don't like, that is evil. And we're just going to edit it, look at it through the cruciform hermeneutic and say, ah, yeah, God didn't really like that. He didn't approve of that. Even though the Bible seems to clearly teach it, definitely not the case. Even though everybody, just about everybody throughout church history would have thought that was just plainly, this is what God was doing. Um, No, it wasn't. And so what ends up happening is the cruciform hermeneutic has two sides. On one side, it goes to the skeptic and unbeliever and says, hey, I, 
I want you to still embrace the Bible. It's not as bad as you thought. But on the other side, it agrees with the skeptic, the critic, and says, yeah, all those passages you think are bad, they are bad unless you have my solution of sort of inverting them so that it, even though it says God did this and that, God said this and that, God didn't really do that, God didn't really say that. So it actually reinforces their bias against the scripture, in my opinion, and it's kind of a, an apologetic that backfires. There's my my opinion about it, and I hope I've accurately understood it. There's always more nuance. There's always more nuance, but I think that the core of it is is that. Number eight, let's look at Jean Robbins, who says, if my wife committed adultery against me and a child resulted from the affair, am I bound to care for the child? Why or why not? And how to go about the situation following finding out? Uh, Jean, I've never even thought about this scenario before now, and it feels... You, most of the stuff I've been asked about, more often than not, I've at least had some time to think and marinate on before I've ever heard the question online. Sometimes, frequently, probably at least once each, every Q&A, there's a question I'm like, hmm, I literally never thought of that. Um, I don't know the right answer, and I'm a little bit scared to weigh in on real-world situations when I don't know the right answer. So I, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hazard a guess. Uh, James says, let you know. Let not many of you be teachers. We shall be judged more strictly. I'm tampering with people's lives with this with this particular question. I would I would just say my only encouragement I can give is go to prayer, go to the Word, and as a Christian, you don't want to just ask what you're obligated to do. You want to ask what would honor Christ and what would seek the Lord in this circumstance, and not limit yourself to mere obligation. Unless you include obligation to be all those things, bringing glory and honor to Christ and seeking to to demonstrate him. But that's a tough one. I would really want to sit and think about that for a long time. Number nine, the Lowry says, in many modern weddings, people promise before God till death do us part or something similar. Doesn't that biblically preclude the option of even a biblical divorce? Um, that's interesting. Um, marriage is... I agree with the phrase till death do us part because marriage is in itself a lifelong commitment. It really just is a lifelong commitment. Even if you don't have that phrase till death do us part, that's what it ideally is supposed to be. You get married and it is until death, till you part. But does the idea of till death do us part, does that mean the marriage cannot be broken? And I, in my really long video, although long is subjective based on the recent videos I've made, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but in my three-hour video on divorce and remarriage, I deal with this issue of, and there's timestamps there, you guys can check it out, of is, um, and this is the heart of the question, I think, is is divorce, uh, or is marriage, excuse me, ontologically unbreakable? And what I mean by ontologically, I, I hate to use that term, but it, I just mean as its very nature like as part of what it is to be married, does that mean that it can't be broken? So that if you get a divorce, you're not really divorced, you're actually still married. So till death do us part me would mean even after a divorce, you're, unless one of you dies, you're still married. So if I divorced my wife and married some other woman, 15, 20 years later, we got three kids, you know, and, and, and someone's like, Mike, you're actually still married to your first wife and every day has been adultery. Every day, even now, even tonight when you go home, that's still continued adultery. Um, I don't believe that that's the case, and I offer several reasons for that in my video on divorce and remarriage. I'll link it down below for anybody after the stream. I'll link it down below. Maybe Ahmad can put the video on divorce and remarriage, the long three-hour one, in the live chat as well. Oh, I look. Hope has already done it. Thank you, Hope. Um, so you guys can check that out. Click, click to that because I give you like a systematic analysis of it, and I talk about it in detail. Because of that... I would understand, yes, it was a lifelong commitment, but you broke it and dissolved it and through adultery and then divorce or even just divorce so that um, there's this new category where I can say, hey, you're actually divorced, even though sometimes there's a moral, this is important to understand it, there's a moral requirement to get back together with that spouse. You're morally obligated to restore the relationship, but that doesn't mean the relationship stays ontologically throughout time no matter what you do hope that makes sense that would be my understanding of it um yeah it was intended it was a deal that was intended so that doesn't mean that it it can't happen when jesus says 
if anyone divorces his wife and marries another, he doesn't say tries to divorce his wife. He uses the terminology that seems to represent divorce. When he talks to the woman at the well, she's had five husbands. But you, that next one wouldn't have even been a husband if she was still married to the first. Right? So the, there isn't this idea of the ontological unbreakability of marriage, although it shouldn't be broken. He doesn't say uh, what God has brought together, man cannot separate. He says, let not man separate. Right? Like it's, it's wrong doesn't mean you, it can't be done. All right, number 10, uh, Florin uh, Peter says, hi, Pastor Mike. Hi, Florin. Uh, I have an agnostic friend who can't accept that the cross was necessary. They believe God was not all powerful if he could not find another way of saving humanity without sacrificing Jesus. Thoughts? Um, this strikes me as, as uh, to be, I'm going to be open with you, as, as somewhat of a silly objection because it's based on the idea that if the cross is necessary for you now, then it's the only conceivable way in all of reality and all the multiplicity of possibilities of, of th that God is aware of. It was the only way that it could have been accomplished. The redemption of humans could have been accomplished. Now, that may be true, but that's not required for you to say you need the cross. Like if you're in a pit and the only available way out is a ladder then you can tell your friend, hey, here's the ladder, it's necessary. And imagine your friend looks up at you from the pit and says, I refuse your ladder because I don't think it is the only way. You could bring me a rope, you could build an elevator, you could fill the pit with water until I float to the top. You could you could create a flying machine and send it out to me. There's probably a lot of ways to get him out of the pit, but guess what? Only one is available at that moment and to, to, to turn it down because theoretically some other way could have been made it just seems foolish it seems unwise so why saddle you why would you accept the burden of proving that the cross is the only logically conceivable way that god can redeem the world even if it is why would you accept that burden in order to prove that it is the way that god has made for us you just need to prove the cross is the is the way and there's no currently available other way and so that's kind of all that you need for him to turn his life to christ Strikes me as a strange um, way of rejecting Jesus. If God's all powerful, he could find some other way. Um, okay. But he did provide this way, and that's the relevant thing you need to deal with. Yeah. Now, would we should we build a case that, that there could be no other way? I mean, Jesus did say, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. That may imply that there really is no other way. And then you could, you would, but here's the problem with this, this line of, as, of evangelism, right? As you're doing evangelism, trend, you now have to navigate every hypothetical way your friend throws at you. If they even do, maybe he, he won't even throw a hypothetical at you. He'll just be like, there's gotta be some other way. And he has no idea what it is, but he's just going to throw it out there. This seems like a distraction from the real issue, which is he's in a pit and Jesus is the way out and he should be receiving that. Um, Ole Andreas uh, Tistetl says, Sorry, I probably got your name wrong. I apologize. How do you interpret Genesis 32 when Jacob wrestles with God? God bless you. Um, Genesis 32, Jacob wrestles with God. Um, there's the tough thing about it, how to saying how do I interpret it is you probably have some specific things in your mind about that. Um, about like the interpretation points. What about this part or that part? And I, I may not answer that as I talk about it right now, but let's just look at this. Um, so verse 13, I think we'll start. So, so he stayed there that night and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau. Okay. Well, he sends out, where is the passage I'm looking for? Ah, look at that. Titles are so helpful. Verse 22, the same night he arose and took two wives with his, his two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And here's what it says. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of dawn of the day. When the man saw, it's, it, it's, let's just highlight. When the man saw, does that mean it had to be human? I, I have to look up the Hebrew. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, 
for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So interesting because he's at the literal lowest point in his life right now. And here he's prevailed. And there's an irony in the preval- in, in the way Jacob prevails because he loses, but he won't let go. He's injured, but he just won't let go. He just He's desperate and he's got nothing else. And he sent all of his stuff onto his brother and he's alone and he's got nothing. And he's worried he's going to die. And he's like, you've prevailed. There's an irony in the way in which he prevailed. Um, then Jacob asked, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you asked my name? And there he blessed him. <laughs> it doesn't tell him his name. And then and Jacob interprets this. He goes, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel saying, for I have seen God face to face. And yet my life has been delivered. The beginning of the passage, Jacob wrestles with a man. Let's just take it that you're asking, who's he wrestling with? How do I interpret that? He wrestles with a man. It says, this man seems to be more than merely a man, right? You've striven with God and with men and have prevailed. He's also supernatural. He just touches the hip. He causes supernaturally things like that to happen. Then Jacob wants to know, tell me the name of the one whom I, who I'm, who I'm dealing with here. And he goes, why do you ask my name? That's all he says. Why do you ask my name? No answer. This is similar to, um, another place where we have what I would say is a, and there's a footnote here that'll help us find it, where we have a similar account like this. Uh, before we move on, just know Jacob then interprets this in a way where he seems to feel like he has somehow encountered God, somehow directly encountered God. That's and he thinks he's he's been delivered. He he didn't die. He didn't suffer judgment or something. So it's it's some gracious, merciful moment. Now in Judges thirteen, um, we have a similar account, and this is about the birth of of Samson, I believe. And, um, the man and his wife are there and this, this whole, it's this whole angel of the Lord thing, right? Um, it says the angel of the Lord says to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. And they're trying to, they have this similar encounter. They have a man who's sort of a man of God in some sense, but they're suspicious that he might be more than that. They ask his name. They want to bring honor to him in that sense. And he won't reveal it to them. He won't reveal his name to them. And then he seems to be. Um, treated as though he is actually God himself in the passage. Um, so uh, let me let me summarize this way. And then I'll point you to my Jesus in the Old Testament series where I actually teach through both of those passages in detail. Okay, so the Jesus in the Old Testament series where I talk about the angel of the Lord. There's a particular angel of the Lord um, video I've done. In fact, uh, Mod, if, if a mod would put the angel of the Lord video in the live chat, that would be great. And I'll link it down below afterwards for those who want to find it in the in the description. Um, here's a man who's more than a man who's been talked about as though he is God. This happens in scripture a number of times. I take them to be the pre-incarnate manifestations of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. He doesn't reveal his name to them. It's different than Jesus in his incarnation where he actually took on human form. He was born into a human. Okay. 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 All right. Thanks. I think we're back. No, we're not. Stinking internet. Just waiting. Making sure. Okay. I'll take that to, that we're back. I'll put the link down below for that video, but, but here's the summary. You've got this man who's more than a man, and there's mystery around him. There's something yet to be revealed about him. He's directly called God in some places, this angel of the Lord character. And then um, I think that all takes its is all a shadow, a sample of what Jesus will be when he actually really, truly becomes incarnate. So that would be my view. That's how I would interpret it. There's probably other questions you'd have about it, but that'll give you something. All right, let's go to question 12. This is uh, an anonymous question. It says, thoughts on insurance and medical aid. I've heard it said that these things are rooted in fear and keep us from truly trusting God. Is that a biblical slash wise perspective to have? Um, no, that's really dumb. (laughs) It's really, really dumb and reckless. Um, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. Proverbs says, would that, would that be fear? Well, yeah, I see bad things coming my way and I hide myself. I bring some protection into my life because of it. Um, the man, a man who sows and stores up for himself for the harvest and then saves plenty for winter, what is he doing except storing up his goods for lean times ahead? 
this is a wise thing. This is wisdom. Okay. So I, I don't understand that view at all. Insurance, medical aid, like the idea of not pursuing medical aid, that's definitely not a biblical teaching. This is utter folly. You're like, I'm injured, but, and I know that that thing would help me, but I'm going to trust the Lord. I mean, God does not want us to be fools here. When we're desperate and we have no help, we, we we want to cry out for help, but we're supposed to be walking in wisdom. And that includes, like Paul says to Timothy, take some wine with your uh with your with your with your drink, with your water, because of your many stomach problems, in his case. And that would help probably to purify the water somewhat. And um I I think that that is is weird. Um well, I, I'm sure there's some scripture someone would bring up to say that insurance is bad because this, this, that. Maybe maybe it's uh, the Psalms that say like some trust in horses and chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. But you have to understand that that doesn't mean that they didn't use horses and chariots. It means they didn't trust in them. They still saw the wisdom of having those things and using them at their appropriate time, but they didn't rely upon them. They ultimately relied on God. I have insurance, and I want to be able to save for retirement, something I most of my life have not been doing. Um, and that's wise. It's wise to do those things, and I feel it's unwise that I've taken so long to try to do that, um, such as, such as life, you know, but the, the thing is, I don't put my trust in those things. My ultimate trust is not resting in those things. It's just wisdom to do it. But my ultimate trust is, is in God. So yeah, I don't trust in man, but it doesn't mean I can't use man. It doesn't mean I won't call a mechanic to fix my car. That doesn't mean I'm trusting in man. That's, that'd be a weird view. All right. Number 13. Let's see. Dom says, hi, Pastor Mike. I'm confused about Eutropelia, and I don't know if it's just crude joking or all jokes that that word speaks of in Ephesians 5, 4. Okay, that must be the Greek word there. I don't know that. Um, I use the King James Version, and it just says jesting. Okay, so I, I take it your question is what in Ephesians 5, 4, what is crude joking? Is that is that the, the question then? Let there be no no filthiness nor foolish talk nor crude joking that's like the internet <laughs> right there which are out of place but instead let there be thanksgiving um ooh, let me let me do this it's gonna take just a moment i'm gonna do an uh a little exegetical search on ephesians 5 4 and see if we can bring up what that word is Crew joking is, uh, like you said, eutropelia. You're right, in the Greek there. And here I'll put up what is considered a fairly, very trustworthy, very reliable source. Um, BDAG, BDAG, which is like a, a, a lexicon. Let's just read this entry and it may help. Sometimes these entries are like pretty complicated and sometimes they're very simple and helpful. So mostly in a good sense, right? Which, which is not how Paul's using it. So that's important to note. When it's used in a good sense, it means like wittiness or facetiousness. Okay, but it isn't always used in the good sense. Um, these these are all just ref ancient references, places where you can find it, like in Philo or Diodorus or something. Um, it could also mean here buffoonery, boorishness. In a bad sense, it can mean coarse jesting or risque wit. Like, ooh, that's kind of a little inappropriate. That kind of humor. And that's the sense that BDAG says is happening in Ephesians 5, 4. And unfortunately, BDAG's article does actually not have a whole lot of information beyond that. So coarse jesting, risque wit, it just sounds like the same kind of thing that you're getting in your English translations. Um, what you've got here in the, you said King James has it as... 13 let's see here jesting you're probably coarse jesting or something though right they're probably translating that word into something coarse jesting or crude jesting or, or something like that it's definitely not jokes in general it's not that the bible's saying you can't have jokes and i'm grateful for that <laughs> but the bible itself has jokes like there's actually some pretty funny stuff in the scripture when you have when you have your awareness of the context and stuff and you go oh that was that was a joke that was pretty funny um but yeah, jo joking is not is not the problem here. It's coarse joking. So the, how I would apply this is joking that for the sake of humor starts to involve sinfulness, either in malicious intent or in inappropriate behavior. Like I said, risque kind of stuff like, oh, that's not really the kind of thing that you should be talking about in, in, in 
normal company or without a more serious tone so you can sort of give this the importance to the topic that it deserves that sort of thing it's i think it's deliberately in ephesians 5 4 deliberately meant to be somewhat vague because it's just meant to encompass all that kind of stuff now we've all done it and some of us have gotten really good at it and it become part of our personality and we don't know what we are without our crude joking and i'd say well that's why scripture is telling you this is because it is a problem there's my my thoughts on that anyways I, I hope you find some help there dom um again it didn't give you tons of information but i think i think it's supposed to be vague so it can be applied to a variety of types of humor um but i would just caution this before we before we go to 13. i would just i would just remind us that there's obviously going to be a gray area right where someone tells a joke and you're like like okay there's stuff that's obviously that's crude that's coarse joking that's obviously wrong then there's going to be this like obviously that's fine joking then there's this like middle gray area where you go is that crude or not i honestly am not sure and this is where a lot of people will spend their time arguing with each other and this i think is not healthy and edifying for the body of christ if it's in that gray area i'm not going to like make a thing about it with people i'm like oh that might have been crude i'm just going to overlook it you know i don't know if it's obviously crude yeah sure what i'm suggesting here is we don't want to turn into the joke police right where where we take stuff that's like you could always in every post i put online there's someone who goes well mike i don't think you should have posted it quite like that was that really christ-like of you like almost everything i post online i'm going to get someone saying that and i'm going to ignore it most of the time because their perception of what is appropriate they have no gray area they just have this massive unacceptable area and anything that even ooh, that might be kind of gray it's automatically that bad thing i think this is not a healthy way to go about things my personal opinion and i think it doesn't help the body of christ that much either okay question 13 um well, i guess we did 13 that was 13 number 14 non-playable character says can we rebuke the enemy oh that's a tough one <laughs> um so there's the jude passage um let me see if I can... I mean, Jude's only one chapter, so it shouldn't be hard to find. But let me see if I can find this for us. Um, yet in like manner, verse 8, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses... He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. This is the only, you know, um, spot where you might find, okay, maybe you can't rebuke the enemy because Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know if I would apply that that broadly, where you could, I think what you would need to do if you're going to be rebuking the enemy is that you have to be able to properly rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus and not presume that you have authority on your own, but that it's the Lord's authority and you're only echoing his rebuke. If that's the case, if you're bringing an echo of God's actual rebuke, that's fine. But if you think you're just posturing your own authority, then it's going to backfire on you and you may get a lesson like the, um, like the exorcists who tried to rebuke we rebuke you in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. And then they got all beat up and sent out improperly clothed. Um, yeah, that's my, my thought on that. There's probably more that could be said on that, but we're, we're running out of time. So Elio Mo says my church recently renovated our hall to be a more, to be more upbeat and have flashy lights. I'm extremely disheartened by this. Do you have any advice? Um, Elio, I, I guess one of the things I would encourage, and I don't know the details here, okay? Maybe there's other things going on at your church that should discourage you, but I would suggest that this probably shouldn't. It's not that important in the big scheme of things. The church has lights, a renovated hall area. Like, I don't see how this is really important that much. You know, in some of us, what we do is we get used to certain things. Um, <clears throat> let me give an example of this. When Calvary chapels were first really getting going, one of the popular things, and we liked it, okay, and I wasn't even around at the time, right? I was I was much later, okay? I was, really became part of Calvary chapels like 2000, okay? So um, really, that's when I really became part of that. But but one of the things that people liked, even as late as 2000, was 
warehouse churches. It was just considered cool and authentic to be like in a warehouse church. And people would just, their church was growing so fast and Calvary grew fast and in, in a glorious way, God really blessed it. And so they just meet in this like big, like warehouse type thing where they just have like folding chairs put out. And then people started thinking that the warehouse church itself represented the authenticity of the movement and the work of the spirit. And as they moved into better, nicer buildings that had better structures and they started to become more trendy and they started putting up more lights and things like that, which did happen, that that represented a move from authenticity to like fabricated spirituality or something like that. I think that these things, we have to, rec here's the thing. Authentic spirituality would recognize that warehouse or fancy lights are irrelevant. It's all the other things that you're, you're just assigning this meaning to this stuff. I remember thinking that when I was really young in the Lord, thinking that a church with, with stained glass windows was somehow compromised. <laughs> and I never would have said it out loud, but I felt it in my heart and it was, I was completely wrong and just very unaware of a lot of things, to be honest. And I'm, I'm so embarrassed to even say out loud I, th I felt that way but i did because i associated the stained glass windows with um r religious the religious move away from authentically just being people of the word to being people of tradition and of man-made traditions and man-made rules and man-made policies that drift further and further from the commitments to jesus that we should have but the stained glass windows had nothing to do with that there's there's nothing wrong with the, those are beautiful and those are wonderful i appreciate them now you know I, I like a building with stained glass windows and 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 cool symbolism and artwork that represents you know truths of christianity so, so i'm just going to suggest that, that you should separate like maybe in your church you're concerned about some other changes that are going on that you see as unhealthy but don't project that onto the lighting and the hall and stuff like that focus on what really matters maybe there's real issues focus on those things pray about those things talk to leaders about those things um if you make it about those other issues, your voice will sound like white noise to them because they'll think, why do you care so much about that? It doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Okay, let's go to question 16. But before we do, I just want to share with you guys, there's an apologetics conference coming up. Okay, I'm not making any money off of anything by sharing this with you. I don't do, I don't work that way. Um, but I, I was asked to share, I actually spoke at this conference last year. I can't make it this year, but they asked me to share it with you guys. So February 9th through 11th, the anchored conference is, and it says mostly apologetics conference. It's, it's for apologists and missionaries, and you can actually get half off if you're, if you use the code I put down in the video description. They gave me a code for you, so any Bible Thinker listeners can get half off by using the ticket code five zero winger two three. That's five zero capital W winger two three, and you get half off. And if you're a, a missionary, you can get a hundred percent off. And there's a link in the, the, the description it has all those details. Anyway, you just put capital D A and then missions 100 for that. If you're a missionary, you can go in person or you can watch online and you can see they have some great speakers. Lee Strobel, J. Warner Wallace, Greg Kokel, Clay Jones, Craig Hazen and Lineage Garrison. And there's other speakers too. go to Desert Apologetics. If you have any questions, you can ask them um, Desert Apologetics, not to me, I'm not the question source for all this stuff. I just wanted to pass on the information. And um, I was there last time. This conference is small enough that you actually get to interact with the speakers a lot if you want to. And so that's kind of a cool thing. And we will go to question number 16. Gumen 130 says, hey, Mike, how do we reconcile the treatment of foreigner slaves, not Israelite servitude, under the old covenant bought as property handed down to children Leviticus 25, 44 through 46. Man, I, at this late for my brain and in the stream here, I wish I had more more juice to talk about this issue because it's a big deal. Um, Leviticus 25. For your male and female slaves whom you may have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. You may also buy from among the strangers who, are, who sojourn with you and their clans that are with you. You've been born in your land who have been born in your land and they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a possession forever. You may make slaves of them, but over your brothers, the people of Israel, you shall not rule one, one over another ruthlessly. There's a lot of details I'd like to get into, but um, I don't have the time or memory at the moment. Let me say a few things that I, how I think we are wise to approach the issue. One, <clears throat> we should not require, um, social societal perfection of the old testament law 
for a couple of reasons. One issue is, and if you don't have this requirement, if you don't think that the law had to be, in, you know, bringing societal perfection, then you're going to change the way you approach things, like how it deals with, say, divorce, or how it deals, like Jesus will talk about that, or how it deals with things like slavery. Um, so one issue is that the if if you do this, then man, my my brain's going already. I feel it. So this is probably not my best answer on this complicated issue. This is exactly the moment where I'm like, oh should have had a gallon of coffee um so one of the issues there is that another issue is jesus seems to affirm that the old testament law is not imperfect or not not bad or not god breathed or something like that but rather that it is situational and that this the, the the carnality of man and the evilness of man brought in laws that are not ideal catch this this is hugely important the evilness of man brought in laws that are not ideal and the law's function was usually, at that point, it seems, to curb some of the abuses or some of the problems that might have happened otherwise in that scenario. Jesus' example is divorce. When they ask him in like Mark 9, I think it is, where he's asked, hey, why did Moses allow them to divorce if you don't want us to divorce our wives? And he says, well, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. And this is Moses is not being meant as a personal slur against Moses here. He refers to the law. The law allowed for your divorces because of your evil hearts. You're going to create such situations in your marriage and in your separations from each other that divorce is going to be regulated, regulated, but not approved. Did you, you catch that? It was regulated, but not approved. And so slavery, like the issue of divorce, was a every society in the world problem up until very recent times. And if you're you have slavery going on at all times, in all cultures of the of, of up until recently then it is something that's understandably regulated even if it's not approved other issues so now once you have that in mind you go oh so these what i would be looking for is how israel's slavery laws were different than the laws of the nations around them to see how god was limiting abuses and limiting the the harm that is caused by this stuff other issues would be um uh the difference between slavery in your head and slavery in the ancient Near East in historical times. And there is radical differences between the two, guarantee it, because we're raised with a certain perspective on this stuff. And I have a teaching on slavery where I talk about some of these, some of these issues. Um, other reasons to look at not just one law, but the other laws of Israel. Like the, the fact that Israel becomes an underground railroad effectively for slaves. If a slave runs from his master and runs to, say you're in one town of Israel, you're a slave, you're being mistreated, you flee to another town of Israel. When you get there, like the Code of Hammurabi would say, you, you send that slave back to his master. And if you don't, you're going to you know be punished physically with, you know, I forget it was cutting your hand off or something like that, or maybe the death penalty, if you don't send that slave back to his master. The Bible's like, no, no, no. If a slave runs, flees from his master, you you give him a place to sleep and lay and, and live, some, some property to live on in this new town, and you don't send him back to his master. The default assumption was if a slave fled, he must have had a good reason. If a man had beaten a slave and abused the slave, then the slave would go free. If, if he killed the slave, the man could get the death penalty himself. Th these are all things that have to be seen as God removing some of the harm and some of the, um, some of the abuse and the, the oppression that comes in a all societies worldwide institution of slavery. That was actually how a lot of poor people would even make a living back then and get protection and stuff. Anyway, super complicated issue. The people from other lands can't be, this is the final thing I'll say, they can't be completely covered by the laws of Israel because they're in these other lands. And so if their option in, in being slaves is I'm, I'm a slave over here or I'm a slave over there, it would have been way better for them to be a slave in Israel than anywhere else. They're even going to be getting rest days and stuff like this in Israel. They're going to be getting higher rights um, in Israel. So this would have been an overall improvement. And so what I what I would say in light of that is God is regulating regulating a generally bad practice, not creating the practice itself. We look at it like it's being created and it's not. So I take Jesus's words. Why does God even have this rules about slavery? Because the hardness of your hearts, right? Because the hardness of your hearts, these things are allowed, but they're regulated. Oh, there's more that should be said about that. And I want to say more because I want to give people the, the appreciation of the goodness of scripture at all times. And, um, but that's all my brain's got at the moment. Smarag 20 says, please, can you talk about what sh 
what should you do when a spiritual leader wants you to only take advice from them and go to no one else, especially when the Bible says have a multitude of counselors, get out of Dodge. That's a huge, scary red flag. Spiritual leaders like only listen to me and nobody else flee from that person. Like Paul, the apostle was like, you know, you have many teachers, many, you know, I planted Apollos watered. That was fine. There was nothing wrong with that. And he points them to Christ. This teacher wants you to say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos and insert their name. I'm of whatever Francis, you know, and you put their name in there. There's a random name for you. Um, and then you're, you're of them and you follow all their teachings guaranteed. They have my, I could say 95% sure they have weird teachings and they know if you go to random Christian teachers other than them, you'll be talked out of some of the weird stuff they teach because they're the only ones who teach it. If they're wanting you to be the only wanting you to only go to them as their only source of spiritual information and wisdom. And that sounds deeply, deeply concerning. You may have been blessed by them in many ways, but this is an unhealthy relationship at that point. Only listen to me. I'm your only spiritual leader. Um, that's deeply concerning. And there's no biblical precedent for it. Number 18, JC says most of the men in the Bible had multiple wives. Can you, can you then, can't you then say they lived in sin their entire lives? Many people say that continual sin doesn't equate to being a true Christian. That's an interesting question. I, I have to push back a little JC. I don't think most of the men in the Bible have multiple wives. I think some of them did, but the majority did not. Um, it was, it was, it was a reality, but it was more of like the, the, the privilege of the rich. And most people weren't rich. Most people couldn't afford that. You know, David had multiple wives, right? And Bathsheba was one of his wives. Uriah only had one wife. Uriah was the normal guy. He was represented the normal person. He's got one wife. David is the guy over here who's got the whole kingdom and he has multiple wives, which he wasn't supposed to do. Um, Solomon had tons of wives, but it's not like everybody in Israel had 1400, you know, women. <laughs> That's not the case. So um, the pervasiveness of, of, of polygamy is a lot less than people think because we tend to focus on the more royal, you know, um, people that we're reading about in scripture who are more inclined to do that sort of thing for a variety of reasons that would never apply to the regular person. Even in, in the days of, of the New Testament, a polygamy was a real thing, but it was not a common thing. It was more like the, the, the rare event where someone had more than one wife. So most of the men in the Bible did not have multiple wives. Um, but what about those that did like say David, uh, can you say they lived in sin their entire lives? Um, I, I have a video on this issue of polygamy and what do you do if a polygamist gets saved? I really struggle with this. I read a whole paper written by a missionary on the topic, a long paper on the topic, trying to wrap my head around it. Let's say a, a polygamist gets saved. They give their life to Christ and they come to you, but JC, they come to you and they say, Hey, I've got two wives. I have a kid from each wife. Do I ditch one of them? I mean, I'm their provider, you know, and in most cultures that the man was going to be needed to provide for her. Do I, do I, do I send her off? Um, do I try to split the provision for her, but I won't be able to pay enough for her to have her own house and for us to have this house, you know? So what do I do? Which one do I split off one? Maybe I have two wives and I have a kid with one, but the other one's the one I married first. Do I send the kid away and the wife, the second wife away? How do I handle this as a Christian? And I think the New Testament handled this in an interesting way. The polygamist could not be a leader in the church because he was living an ongoing bad example for the body of Christ, but it didn't mean he wasn't saved. And so do not become a polygamist as a Christian. That might reveal something really serious about your, your seriousness of following Jesus, but you can't be in leadership and be this example for other believers. This implies that the polygamist the polygamous relationship is complicated and problematic, but not necessarily evidence that they're just not saved. That would be my, my short answer. Check out my video. I'll link that below too, for anybody interested. Um, what do you say to a polygamist who gets saved and how I try to tackle that question. And again, keep this in mind, guys, I'm, I'm not, it's not Mike's answers are the definitive answers. Um, I try to talk in a way that exposes my thought process and some scriptures that weigh in on these issues so that you can have your thought process and you feel free to disagree with me, not offended in any way, shape or form. And if you don't, if you never disagree with me, then I wonder if you're really thinking about this stuff very carefully, because you, you, I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to get stuff wrong, but you're just learning to think biblically by being drawn back to scripture. How many were really polygamous? What does the scripture say about the polygamous? That kind of thing. Question 19, Ben Rebman says, my boss is a leader in the LDS church. He is a good and friendly boss, 
but calls himself a Christian. Do I have a responsibility to confront him? And if so, how do I do this respectfully as he is my boss? That's a tough one. Um, been, um, you know, God give you wisdom here. I don't know if there's, there's a ton of hard and fast rules about all this stuff, but you obviously want to maintain a respectful relationship of submission to your boss. But yet here you would be coming and bringing correction to him on a very deep spiritual matter. And so, I, I mean, my, my default personally would be to look for a non-work environment wherein to talk to him about those issues. Hey, can we get lunch? I wanted to talk to you about some stuff. And then show him before and after that conversation that whatever happens in that conversation isn't going to affect your continued support and submission to him as your boss and respect. Um, but it would be to me that would maybe that would create the separation between this 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 deeply deeply important spiritual conversation you want to have and the work environment so that he doesn't have the obstacle of thinking that your um, submission and support of his leadership is in threat as you're trying to talk to him about these deeply important spiritual issues. That'd be my my, my two cents. Um, and you said, do I have a responsibility to confront him? <sighs> Maybe that's the wrong way to look at it, Ben. Um, there's there's times where you can say, that's not my job. That's not my job to answer everybody, deal with everybody, talk to everybody. But clearly this guy's in your life. Clearly you have the wisdom and the knowledge to know that stuff's going on there with his his spirituality. His, his uh, the Mormonism teaches a number of foundationally false things about Jesus and about Christianity. And it's difficult to talk to Mormons because, not because they're rude or something, but difficult to get clarity because they think they're Christians and they, they're taught they are but they have wrong definitions for all the same things we we claim. I believe in Jesus, yeah. So you believe we're saved by grace? Absolutely, it's just grace, yeah. But you have to do works though to ultimately be saved. Right? Well, like, well, yeah. But but what do you mean by saved? Oh, by saved, I have like all these definitions of heaven and different experiences in the afterlife and all, and it just gets super confusing. I'll link another video down below, which is about like how Mormons have the same words but different meanings, and that might help you navigate that conversation. I'll put that down below for you to check out the differences between some some Mormon theology and Christian teaching. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe God would give you an opportunity to pull him aside and talk to him outside that environment. It may or may not be your total responsibility. I don't know your circumstance, but you might have an opportunity to confront him and that would be worth it. Number 20, Julia Stoltz... Oh, Julia, nobody can pronounce your last name. <laughs> Stoltzfus. <laughs> Stoltzfus. Okay, maybe I can. My brother b brought up 2 Kings 20... Chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, to challenge the goodness of God. He saw imbalance of justice when bears came to maul 40 boys for making fun of Elisha. How would you respond to this? Um, at first, I'm really curious what it is your, your uh, brother is saying. Is he saying, I think God really did this and I think it was wrong? Or is he saying, I don't think God did it because God would never do that sort of thing. And that proves that the Bible's not inspired because it has God doing something I don't think he would do. Like, I, would, I would want to know first which one of those he's saying. And if he's like, that yeah, proves that God didn't really inspire. I would go to other things to try to prove the inspiration of scripture to him and prophecy and um, talk about Jesus and all that. Um, but this is what it's like. Sometimes with, with, with witnessing, it can be like playing whack-a-mole because you have things where you're like, this shouldn't be the central issue you're thinking about when you're talking about coming to Christ, but yet it's the thing you'll throw up. What I would want to know, Julia, and for you to pay attention to this, if you answer this question sufficiently, if you give decent, reasonable responses to, to your brother, does he care after you do? And don't get mad at him if he doesn't. It's just a diagnostic tool, right? Let's say you answer this question to his satisfaction. Does he care? And does he go, wow, I need to rethink whether God is really good, like you said? Or does he go, oh yeah, well, here's another objection and here's another objection. And then it's like whack-a-mole or I answer objections that the objector doesn't care about. Now, why is that important? And I don't want to get mad about it. I just want to recognize it because if you keep doing that, you realize you're solving problems they don't care about. You need to find the problems they do care about and solve those. So then you ask them questions like what objection to Christianity that if, if I could bring you good evidence or good answers, it might actually bring you closer to Jesus. Give me one of those objections. What objection will change you if you get good answers for it versus just 
jumping to another objection because this strikes me as one that people just throw out there because it's a gotcha thing and they don't usually care that much about the answer in my opinion and but i'll try to bring some thoughts anyways so um elisha he's he goes up from there to bethel and while he was going up on the way some small boys and that, that's what it, the esv puts it as small boys and there's a huge debate on that came out of the city and jeered at him saying go up you bald head go up you bald head and he turned around and when he saw them he cursed them in the name of the lord and two she bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys from there he went on to mount carmel and from there he returned to samaria so this is like the the the, the killing of these the esv says small boys let's look at some other translations what, what do they say about verse 23 there who is it that's being killed here some youths new king james version some youths came from the city and mocked him in iv it says um, as he's walking the road some boys okay well, so we have youths which would imply perhaps to my english ears older like youths i think when i say youth i usually think of teenagers or, or older um probably not that much older probably teenage range um, but when ESV says small boys, right, you're thinking, oh, well, like small boys. So like four year olds or something like that. And then the NIV uh, says just some boys, which could be generic and who knows what age they are. Um, like the RSV, um, it says small boys, RSV. Now, interesting, the, the ESV is a rendition of the RSV. The RSV is the foundational text for the ESV, which is a little surprising because I think the ESV is a lot better than the RSV most of the time. And you can go through other translations. And what here's what I would share with you or your brother uh, is that when you see these different translations translating the same term and it feels like it means something different, it's at least revealing to you that behind the translation is a Hebrew phrase that they're not 100% sure how they want to render or there's a debate on it, right? Like how old were these kids? It's not entirely clear. Now, if you look up this term, this exact Hebrew term, it does often refer to more like children or pre-adolescent, like pre-pubescent type boys, boys that are at least, I would maybe not pre-pubescent, maybe that's too young, but boys that are like not really responsible and trustworthy with, with responsibilities yet. It often refers to that, but does it always refer to that? And is that what it means in this passage? Um, so there's a passage where Solomon is becoming king and is referred to as the same Hebrew word there small, for small boys. Same Hebrew word. Now Solomon was an adult at the time, absolutely an adult. What was what was being said about Solomon? David kind of kind of puts him in his place before he becomes king, and he's like, "Look, this, this little kid is going to be taking over the throne." And what's being said about him is about his maturity level and not about his age. Isn't that interesting? Now, there, there, there's a possibility that one of the things that we're getting here is that these kids are punks and that's what's being said about them these small boys are punks now for those who picture it being like five and four year olds because there are some who suggest that five six year old kids there is that would imply that there is a gang of over 40 like five year old kids predominantly and they're coming out of the city to harass the prophet of god as a group and the setting starts to look silly like these kids and then they go go up you bald head go up this is a specific insult that's that's being uh, said to him. There, there's context of the phrase go up as well that implies like um, rationality and reasoning skills. I know James Bijan is one scholar who he wrote like a little paper on this about them using the phrase go up, you bald head. They're trying to suggest that um, that uh, something negative about Jerusalem effectively, I think. And that implies a lot more is going on a lot more intellectually is going on with this insult than merely little kids making fun of somebody okay so already at least i'm going to say say this for those who were confident that these were just like these little kids that got that got killed by bears and how evil was that i think that that isn't something they should be confident about it's not something they should be confident about it's entirely possible it's a, a group of punk kids um, you know, five and six year olds don't usually run around in crews like that, but teenagers would sometimes do that. Teenagers, or maybe even older, going out in, you know, what age do people usually go out in in crowds of youth where they might be causing trouble for other people and that sort of thing, and that, that's a little bit of an older age. So it could be being used to deride them as being sort of these immature brats and not just speaking of their age. Um, in the end, though, I think the bottom line is this. 
Whenever we're confronted, and this is a principle I would throw out for your brother to consider, whenever we're confronted with God bringing judgment down on somebody, and we think they didn't deserve that, the hypothetical here is God Almighty, who knows all things and is actually holy, he's a worse judge than me, who knows this much, two verses. I know two verses about the situation in these people, and I can overrule God's judgment and declare that I have discovered that God was wrong and he should not have done that. That's a general mentality that I think is alien, obviously alien to Christianity, alien to any scriptural concepts, where I would look at and say, God, you shouldn't have done that. That was wrong of you. There's times in scripture where people kind of look at God that way. Like Hosea feels like, God, you couldn't do that. You couldn't judge people like that. And then later he's like, yeah. I I didn't realize how bad they were. And that's actually the key is I didn't realize how bad they were. When you start to realize how evil sin is and how evil the sin they're doing in in this scenario is, you would start to realize that God's judgment was just and right. The people of Israel are generally rebelling against God who owns them, who rightly can be the only one who owns all of us and who has blessed them and called them out and called them his children and given them his laws and offered them protection. And now they're rejecting him rejecting his prophet and they're mocking the messenger of God who sent to bring them back to him to bring them even deliverance right but when Elisha's out there who who gets delivered like a, a a Gentile widow instead of instead of the Jewish people because they're just rejecting ultimately what God is doing in, in their lives that rejection is embodied by this group of rebellious people who mock and ridicule the prophet of God and therefore mock and ridicule God himself. How big of a deal is that sin? Well, it depends on how much you respect God. If you highly respect God, you will think it's a pretty big sin. If you have low respect for God, as it seems your brother might, then you probably won't think it's that big of a sin. And then you might think that you have better judgment than God. Everything about that is problematic. Even if you, at the end of the day, looked at this verse and you go, I don't know what was what was going on there. I don't know how old these kids were. I don't know how to reconcile that and explain that it was just... But I know this, God does what's right and it would be utter folly for any human to shake their fist at the creator and say, I have a bet, I have better knowledge of the scenario and better, a better sense of justice than you've got. This is incredible folly. So the hypothetical of God did something I don't like. And so I shake my fist at him. That never works because it ignores God's holiness, God's goodness, God's wisdom and knowledge. And it attributes those things to me. I'm I'm holier than God. I have more wisdom than God on this issue. I have more knowledge, apparently. I know something. I know enough to be able to be the judge of this thing. And ultimately, I would make a better judgment than God. Uh, this connects to arrogance and not anything more than that, I think. Is that going to help your brother? I don't know. You might just get mad. <laughs> but sometimes people have to get mad because that's what the truth is doing to them. And then maybe... After they get mad, they get sad. Then after they get sad, they get glad. <laughs> that's that's the hope. That's the hope. We might we have to just share the truth and see what happens when we do. So I I, I hope that has been fruitful for you guys and helpful. I'll remember to put those videos in the link, links down below. I think I mentioned three or so videos. I'll be linking down below. Just give me a few minutes. Thank you guys for being here. That was question 20. I don't think we got yeah, nothing else. I will see you next Friday. I will be doing a Q&A next Friday. Don't know what will happen for the rest of the December but hopefully I'll see you then. Um, let's pray. Um, Father, we we ask for wisdom uh, as we encounter the world and we want to show them the goodness of, of Scripture and the goodness of Christianity and the truthfulness of Christianity. I mean, those are two very different but connected things. We want to show them that Christianity is good and that it's true. We pray that you'd help us to be witnesses that can c- communicate that stuff, Lord, that we would be able to build bridges, but without giving in to lies, without without yielding to false things that people are saying and believing at the same time as we're trying to build a bridge with them. We just pray for that wisdom and discernment. And we ask that you help give us courage to be able to handle it if people respond negatively. We we pray that you let us be your witnesses. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty.